Well, hi. Thanks for coming out. Is that, you, you never know when you throw nuclear physics out. <laughs> you start to listen for the you know, crickets chirping. But, um, but yeah, but thanks for coming. So hopefully this will work out really well. I, I wanted to kind of follow in the footsteps a little bit of the teachers who had already been uh, with, with Robin Tootster, who came in a little bit before, and Sarah Conley, who talked a little bit about Okay, how do, you know, Robin talked a lot about education for those who maybe got a chance to see it, just the nature of it. Sarah took you through a day of a freshman physics kind of student a little bit to see how that goes. And what I was thinking is maybe just go through like a lecture format a little bit of how we try to build things when we're office teaching, especially in the high school and I know throughout the buildings, um, is trying to start with things that we know and try to kind of cement that before we kind of build and build and build from there. So. Weirdly, nuclear physics, at least in the place we look at it, the fundamental idea is, is not that complicated. Now, to make it work technically, that's a whole other job, right? But hopefully today will be pretty smooth, so we'll see how we do. Um, and then feel free, by the way, anywhere along the way to raise a hand if you have a question or something. You know, feel free to do that. Um, all of the slides that are here are just follow along in the pages as well. So whatever makes it easy for you. Um, oftentimes, if I were presenting this to students, there would be a little more bare bones to this. I've kind of filled it out a little more completely because um, I don't have a smart board or things that I can usually do where I'd be asking them questions, filling in parts, writing on the board, doing different things with them. So this will be a little more directed than a normal one, but we'll do a, a little bit of a, see how we do, but feel free to ask questions as we go. So we'll take a look and start off. So let's see how we do. We'll start off with the very first thing, which is just talk about um, I like to start with the simplest one, the one that we know really the very, very most, which is working with gravity, right? Something that we just deal with on an everyday basis, sometimes unfortunately. <laughs> but I figure in this case, here's the simple things I want us to keep in mind. Anytime a force exists, anytime a field exists, we can create or store energy, right? So if I take something as simple as you know, a stapler or whatever, and I have it in this spot, I know there's a gravity force exerted downward, okay? If I go ahead and lift it up, I'm effectively doing work, which is exerting a force through a distance. That's kind of the technical piece of it. But as I'm doing it, I'm storing energy. I can now do something with this. If I want to drive a nail with it, I can drop it, right? If it's water, I can have it up here. I can go ahead and run it through a hydroelectric um, power, you know, to a power generator to create electricity. So that's stored energy. And often what we look at is this simple idea of we store energy, we let it go. We often talk about the idea of turning from potential energy, which is the ability to do work, turning into kinetic energy as it falls, right? And we can use that energy for any number of things, right? Pile drivers, if you want to break up concrete, or again, we look at the simple systems of like solar energy, pumping water up, raining somewhere, going through a river, down to a hydroelectric dam to give us electric energy, right? You see those energy transfers all the time. What I want to focus particularly on is that idea of potential energy turning into something else. That's really going to be our key idea as we work through. So what do we see? Lift an object up, I drop it down. As it starts to fall, that energy kind of, you know, translates into motion, translates into what we call kinetic energy, energy of motion. But it's got to go somewhere. So one of the things that's interesting is I put this energy in, I drop it, and all of a sudden it stops. And you're like, where did that energy go? Well, one of the rules of physics, and well, really the rule of the universe that the physics <laughs> folks have noticed. It's, it's not like the physics folks said, this is how the universe works. But the, uh, have, that energy's got to go somewhere. It can't disappear. So in this case, what you would have noticed if we had a really sensitive thermometer is my hand and the stapler got a little warm. Because that energy had to go somewhere and it seemed to disappear. Potential's gone, kinetic's gone, it's got to go somewhere. Um, so I joke with my kids, that, you know, if you're cold, just keep punching yourself and you'll get warmer. Um, you see it here, like if you've ever watched, like, uh, you know, the, after, like, a, when some of the early Apollo missions, when they'd come back and you'd start seeing the landers coming into the Earth and they're just, like, lit up crazy hot. And you're wondering, why are they so hot? Well, one of the things you're doing when you're landing is you're coming back from the moon a lot of potential energy above the earth because you've worked so hard to get there. As you've got to get to the ground, you've got to dissipate that energy. So as we hit the earth, as we kind of get into the atmosphere, compressing all that air and running into all that stuff creates tons of heat and friction, right? So we're turning potential energy into heat. Effectively, that transfer is what we want to build on today, that simple idea. If I lift something up 
and let it fall, if it goes to another lower energy, I can get that energy and tap it for something else. Does that idea make sense? Does anybody have a question about that at all? I get it so far, Greg. So far, so good. <laughs> all right, good. All right, so this is going to be, a, we're, we're already to the hardest part, so this is good. Um, <laughs> always having flashbacks to high school, he's ready. <laughs> this is good. Now, in this case, any time you can have a force, you can do this, right? So in this case, what I want to do is talk a little about chemical potential energy before we get to nuclear. So let's say I take two charged objects. It could be like a proton and electron, um, anything like that, or I could, you know, whatever, and I pull them apart. They electrically attract. It's not gravitational, but if I pull them apart, there's potential energy. If I let them come back together, they would smack towards each other and do the same thing that gravity does. So we see that whether it's electrical, whether it's gravitational, the same system as it were. And this is really the basic thing that is tying all of the chemical energy that we see in our everyday life. So I ate some breakfast this morning in my body right now. I'm actually converting potential energy into other energy to move around, do whatever I need to do. When we heat our homes, we do all of the above. That's the same exact game. It's about stored energy turning into, as we reduce that stored energy, we can use it for other things, right? So as I work my way through, I'm used to going to the smart board, so sorry. I'm going to probably do that about 10 times. The, um, so as we look here, I'm going to take a second thought to get us thinking a little bit about chemicals. And this is the idea of entropy. Now, I'm not sure how many folks have probably heard the term entropy before. Um, but in this case, entropy is a, a simple thing called, it's, it's a measure of disorder. right? And one of the things we have is the second law of thermodynamics states, every natural process will go to a greater degree of entropy in you. Every single thing makes the universe more disordered. Not a single thing we do ever makes the universe more ordered. Even if I clean my room, which Mrs. Rackvan tells me to do every now and again, I still am making more disorder because I may get my socks and things and parts and pieces and everything put away and everything looks really good, but all the heat that I vented doing that actually made the universe more disordered than the order I created. Nothing happens in the universe without a greater degree of disorder. So we're always heading in that direction, no matter what. doesn't mean you can't organize. With an input of energy, you can always do that, right? With sunlight right now, we can grow plants. We can do things. It's all good. Um, as soon as the sun stops, it's over, right? Um, by the way, we'll be, like, already, it's going to swell and absorb the earth long before that, so don't worry. Um, but in this case, what we're looking at is this simple idea of being more disordered. Things don't like to be together. Things like to be apart, right? That's a natural sta state. So... We start thinking about bonded molecules, you know, atoms bonded in molecules or protons and neutrons bonded in nucleus. That's not normal in a sense because the universe likes things to be spread out. I uncork some perfume, you know, or whatever it is. Not sure why I would do that, but if I do, you know, who knows? If I just need to, who knows? But as you do it, that's going to spread through the room. It's not going to stay in one place. It's, gonna, it's natural for matter to spread. It's natural for energy to spread. So one of the things that we look at is... How are you going to keep them together? If you have two objects, and I just took two you know, balls at random here and said, if I want to keep them together forever, how am I going to keep them together? Well, you have a couple choices. You can leave them on flat ground, in which case they may move, they may not. Who knows? I can put them up on top of a hill so they're isolated. But think about what would happen, right? Even the littlest shake or breath of air, they're going to leave. What's your best choice? dig a deep hole and put them in, right? If I put them in a hole, they can't escape. If I can lower their energy so that they have to, or they require energy to climb out, I can trap them there. My students, I've often used the analogy that that's a little bit like my marriage, but um, <laughs> instead of putting energy into my marriage, remove it so that she can't leave me. But that's a you know, different sort of thought, but... <laughs> Ask her, she'll probably tell you. Anyway, um, but it, that's the real key thing is we need to get things at low energy. So if that idea works, I want you to keep in mind. So things want to go to disorder, but if I can drop them in a hole, I can trap them. Any questions on that? So far, so good? Oh, sorry, go ahead, please. What about the Vanderbilt's forces of mutual attraction? What, what, what is, how does that happen? That's a great question. In fact, as we're looking at different types of th reasons why things stick together, um, all of that turns out to be electrical. 
So we're going to look at that idea just really, if, it, if I hold that thought for 30 seconds, and I'm going to, I'll address it if you don't mind. That's a great question. That's the highest class. <laughs> no, it's great. And it'll fit in perfectly with this, so it's great. So what I'm going to do is talk just a little bit about covalent bonding. So whether you've taken chemistry or, you know, at some point, or it's been a little while since you've done it, you know that atoms can bond onto molecules, right? We wouldn't be here if they didn't. And one of the things that's interesting about it is why do they, right? So that's, and I'll get to that thought too in just a moment if that's okay. So let's say we take two hydrogen atoms. What would they prefer to do? They prefer to be apart. That's what entropy would tell me. Yet we know hydrogen exists as a molecule, H2, right? That exists, that's its normal state if it's not crazy heated up. So why? Well, one of the things we find is electrical attractions exist between the molecule, between the atoms. So if you're a hydrogen atom with an electron floating around you and I'm the same, as we get nearer to each other, your proton starts to attract, your inner nucleus starts to attract to my electron, I start to do to you, and we can actually attract one another and get to a lower energy, just like attracting to the earth and getting to a lower energy. That's the effect of actually dropping in a hole so we can't get out. So when you talk about bond energy, folks will often talk in chemistry about bond energies. People will mistakenly think I'm putting energy in to hold things together. That's absolutely not what you're doing. You're actually allowing it to fall so it can't get out. Just like we're trapped on the earth. We can't get out, right, without sufficient energy to get away. And so what happens is it comes in, it'll actually get closer and closer and closer and closer and closer and drop into this negative energy <coughs> hole and become a stable hydrogen molecule. If I get it too close, our protons and things get so close to each other, they don't like that so much. It gets too spring-loaded. The energy starts to increase again. So there's a happy spot there where I'm in this perfect little hole and I'll stay together. So something like Van der Waals forces, for a quick thing, uh, Van der Waals forces are forces that exist between molecule to molecule. So if I had things like a, a nonpolar molecule like oxygen or hydrogen, for example, it doesn't have this natural positive negativeness to it. They're pretty neutral, so they don't tend to attract very well. Um, but it does turn out that the electrons around them can get a little unbalanced, and they can tend to get a little plus minus on one side and stick together a little bit. Almost like you think north-south for a magnet, but not the same thing. So that can create stickiness. So a lot of things that we see that are stuck together, we wonder why they're stuck together. A lot of it's coming from that. So like if you look at the plastic in this chair, um, those are all nonpolar molecules that are just, they have their own bonds within that are this type of covalent bond, but they stick, these big molecules stick to each other by these weird little electron interactions that create forces that drop them in a hole and keep them together. So whether it's covalent bonding, maybe occur hydrogen bonding, water, all those sort of things are all about attractions. Really all there is. Um, if I give away the secret that's literally that's all there is to chemistry, you'll realize my teaching is not all that uh, difficult. Um, but it's all about attractions and repulsion. That's the game. Does that help at all for that one? Does that make some sense? Good. Um, any other questions so far about this idea of covalent bonding and getting to a lower energy? Good so far? All right, so now we're moving towards nuclear slowly. but. I just wanted to look at the basic idea of what do we use nuclear reactions for. If you're using a reaction, you're usually using it to make heat. We're using that heat to make steam, using steam to drive a turbine, we're using a turbine to make, um, you know, electricity, <coughs> that sort of thing. Well, we do the same thing actually on a large scale right now with hydrocarbons, right? So we burn a lot of natural gas or in the old days. My family was a family of coal miners before my dad left. Uh, you know, central, south Pennsylvania. So when you look at these sort of things, we, we burned a lot of stuff to kind of make energy. How did we get energy from it? Well, right, most of you probably, unless you've maybe converted to electric and start having like heat pumps in your houses now, are probably burning um, methane, right? Natural gas is the it's primary uh, component of methane. So, and if you have a stove that's, um, that's not electric, you're burning that same stuff. So how, where does that heat come from? Well, Molecules of methane are covalently bonded in their structure, so they're in a hole. And that's why the carbon sticks together with these four other hydrogens. They've gone into a hole and they can't get out, right? And oxygen is the same. What's interesting is if I can get them to smack into each other, they can kind of break apart a little bit or at least kind of sever those bonds a little bit because as the energy comes into the hit, that'll actually let them raise up enough that those bonds become weak enough <coughs> 
that they can now reform into different molecules. In this case, they reform into carbon dioxide and water, right? So that's what's coming out of your stove. If you're there just looking at there's carbon dioxide bubbling off and there's, you know, water vapor that's bubbling off. Same thing if you're burning gas in your furnace. Not too much different if you're doing gasoline combustion engines too. It's just a different molecule instead of methane. So what happens is they bump up an energy, but then when they drop into this new zone, these are in a deeper hole. They are more strongly attracted. The atoms are closer to one another. Remember, the closer we are to the Earth, the lower our potential energy. So if I can make the atoms be closer to each other, I am now at a lower potential energy when I ended than where I started. Right? So in that case, I've got to get that energy to go somewhere. In this case, it vents as heat. It's a basic exothermic reaction, nice and simple in the grand scheme of things. That's what we've been basically built our entire industrial revolution on so far uh, to this point. We're in transition now because we're obviously seeing some difficulties with burning lots of carbon compounds, but we're starting to kind of work forward to see you know, what's going to be the next thing in that mode. Does that make sense to everybody? Does anybody have a question about that? Yeah. Covalent. So, sorry, good question. Um, so when I mentioned before about you being a hydrogen and, and us, basically you're mutually attracted to electrons, so are I. So I kind of always like to think about it. If you go to a party, you want a bunch of people to gather. What do you do? Put a bunch of food on the table. Everybody comes, right? Because and it, whether, you know, let's say Howie comes to the table, whether he likes me or not, right? We're, we're both looking going, wait, there's snacks. Let's go, right? Um, and so we're mutually attracted to that. The electrons are basically the same. So your nucleus being positive will be attracted to those shared electrons. My nucleus would be, so we call it covalent. So the electrons are the valence electrons, and the co part is kind of like how we sort of mutually attract to something. Because we don't particularly like each other as nuclei. Because you're positive, I'm positive, that would tend to repel. But we like the electrons in between us. <laughs> I don't know if that helps. Yeah, yeah. Does that work? We like the snacks. <laughs> right. Other questions so far? How does the energy get raised up? The, I missed the 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 increase of the potential. Yeah, where does that come there? from? Yeah, in the in the I'm thinking of the stove example. Yeah. In your diagram? Mm -hmm. What causes that to go up? Great question. So in this case, there's a couple things you may notice. Uh, we need to get what is called an activation energy often. So sometimes if you just take methane and oxygen and put them in a bubble or put them in a balloon, nothing's going to happen, right? Not immediately. Because they're going to run into each other, but, it, but they generally lack sufficient energy in that collision to get, because collisions, they come in with energy that can heat things up, but often not quite enough. What we often have to do to get it, and I noticed with my daughter's, I, I have an electric stove, so mine's different, but I went to my daughter's house the other day, and she's got one, and all of a sudden you just click, 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 right, as the spark goes. We're using, in that case, electricity to do it, or we have one burning already, right, with a pilot light. What's happening is, weirdly, once you do the click, right, you get that little electrical jolt that cranks the energy up for that molecules. You arc across a couple of molecules, get extra energy to pump up and get hot. Right. They hit each other hard. They bump up enough in energy to start breaking apart. Interestingly, the heat that they start to vent on their, on, as those drop feeds the next one, which feeds the next one, which feeds the next one. It actually kind of just becomes this continuous process. So once you get it started, it'll sustain itself. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that helped. Is, Is that your name for that? Um, Fire. No, that's no, a great question. Initiation. I have to think about no, that. Yeah, it's like it's almost like an initiation, but yeah. then yeah, and so they'll so, often say you have to overcome the activation energy, but then it's like a self-sustaining process where that thing starts to keep right. back feeding if that helps. Right. So something yeah. has to be added in to, to boost the potential energy up in your yeah. diagram. So either I have to heat stuff, like if I kept cranking up the heat from something else, sure. I could do it, or that ignition to get it started is real key. Same thing with our cars. You know what I mean? We actually do a couple things with combustion cars, right? We compress the gas, which right. heats the, you know, the heats it a lot. Out. But then we also have a spark plug that pops it just a little bit. Um, so it depends. Diesel engines don't need the spark plug, for example. They get hot enough just in the compression mm -hmm. from the cylinder itself. So it just depends. But you've got to get that energy up to get started. But once it gets started, it'll sustain. Okay. All right. How do we feel about that idea? Thanks for the question on the code. Those are really good questions so far. Thank you, guys. Um, so far, so good. Anybody have questions about this one? All right, I think we're getting ready 
to move on to nuclear stuff. So let's see how we do. So here's what I want us to start thinking about nuclear stuff. So if we've got that feeling of lower energy is more stable, think about it. We are packing into the tiniest of tiniest little spaces, protons and neutrons. Neutrons, not such a big deal because they're neutral. But we're taking particles that do not like each other, right, that want to repel each other, and we're forcing them to stay together in the tiniest things we have, right, the tiniest spaces you can even imagine. And so how do we do it? Well, there's only one way. The only reason things stay together is if you dig a deep hole and drop them in. And in this case, we dig a deep hole, but you're like, wait a minute. The hole would be electrical in our minds, right? And I'm thinking, you're a proton, I'm a proton. I don't want to get near you. In fact, nothing, I want to go far away. So there must be another force. Because gravity's not going to do it. It's not strong enough. The electrical repulsions are the wrong way. <coughs> but there's something called the strong nuclear force, which is even stronger <laughs> than the electrical forces on very short distances. So in the distances of a nucleus, the strong nuclear force is incredibly attractive between protons and neutrons. And it creates this attractive force that's so much stronger than, way stronger than gravity, way stronger than electrical forces in that short distance, and can pull these protons and neutrons into this very low energy state close to one another and keep them in a hole. And how deep they're in the hole is going to be the key to what we're talking about today. So just like we had before, separations, they come together, they get to attract into a hole, they get too close, not so much, and that determines the size of the nucleus. When am I close enough to maximize the attractions and minimize the repulsions? It's all those, you know, engineering life is always looking for that median spot. Sound okay so far? Mm -hmm. By the way, that's also why electrons stay in atoms, right? They're attracted to the positive. That's, that's an electrical attraction in some ways. There's different ways to think about it, but imagine those staying in there. They can't get out because they've fallen into the nuclear. Doesn't temperature have something to do with that? Absolutely, sure. Yeah, so if you increase temperatures at quite a, quite a degree, you can give energy. Just like we were talking about the activation mm -hmm. energies, and the electrons can start to separate um, and get farther away. Some of that you can see if they get far enough away, they may drop back down and emit light, which is like neon balls and different sort of things. If you've ever seen glowing hydrogen tubes and things like that. Um, and that's also kind of a little bit, but eventually, you, if you get it hot enough, you know, it will actually start separating the electrons and will get enough energy to leave. What happens if you and, cool it enough, get near absolute zero? Um, that gets to be a pretty interesting question down there as you get that low. Generally, things are going to be in a solid state by that point if you're getting near absolute zero because there's not enough energy to even separate themselves at all. And what electrons do at that state is a pretty interesting question that I'm not... I'd say I'm definitely not qualified to answer at that level because as you get that cold and that low in energy, um, it gets really interesting. Everything gets incredibly sluggish, very crystalline in structure. The electrons are there. How much, what electrons do when we're not looking at them is a really big mystery anyway. Um, and so I, that would be a quantum question. It's a little farther down the road than I know enough, to be honest. All right, how do we feel here? Good so far? <laughs> exactly. All right, so here we go. So let's take a look at this. This is kind of an interesting thing. I'll see if this makes sense. And this is just a quick little, quick little addition. I promise this looks kind of scary, but not bad. Um, we, we basically measure particles in what are called atomic mass units. So we, protons about one atomic mass unit, uh, a neutrons about one atomic mass unit, and electrons about maybe 1,600 times less massive than a proton or a neutron. And this is just a fascinating thing to see. I want to build a hydrogen atom. I build it with one proton and one electron. That's a standard hydrogen. And what you're going to notice is these are the particle masses I add up. And that's the mass of the individual particles that make up a hydrogen atom. If I measure the mass of a hydrogen atom, no surprise, it's exactly that same mass. That'd be like I weigh me, I weigh my, you know, Julie, we stand on the scale together, we weigh the same, right? What's interesting, though, is I'm going to take a look at the next one that's just a little bit more complicated, the helium atom. Two protons, two neutrons in the nucleus, two electrons. If I add up all the masses of the protons, the neutrons, and electrons, I get about 4.03-ish AMUs. If I take an actual helium atom and put it on a scale, it weighs about 4.026. 
Exactly. Or 0026, right? <laughs> which, is, which is a small difference in a way, but why? And you start to wonder what's going on here. Well, here's the thing. In a proton and electron set, I have a proton here that doesn't have to bind to anybody. It doesn't have to be any, in a hole with anybody. And the electron kind of is, but it's, you know, not like, it's an electrical force. It's not that strong. If I want to bond these nuclear particles together, I've got to drop them in a hole. They've got to lose potential energy. Well, one thing that we remember from Einstein's world, E equals mc squared. Mass and energy are just different forms of the same thing. Mass is just condensed energy. So how do I notice that my nucleus is actually at a lower energy and fell down into a hole? It's less massive than it was before. That's true for all of us, truthfully. Um, if I take an object and heat it up, it's actually more massive than it was when it was cool. That's just such a small effect we would never notice it. It's not like, oh, I was just in a cold bath. Oh, I lost weight. Right? I'm not going to see that, right? But it's, it's there if we could measure closely enough. And so what we notice is mass values as we start to bond start to decrease. But that's really just energy that's gone because I dropped myself in a hole. And that didn't happen in hydrogen. It didn't have to bond in that nuclear spot. We really see it in the nucleus. A, a, a more energetic electron would be slightly less massive than, the, you know, I mean, or you know, I mean, more massive than the other. If you're looking at the energy value, but it's such a small effect with the electron. But in the nuclear spot, we really see it. Does that feel okay? Yeah. Weird thought in my mind is like if I need to join a nucleus, it's almost like oh, I got to chop up my arm to go join because I have to be less massive. And if I want to get out, you've got to get in my arm back to climb back. That's where that stability thing is. That's where that energy value it shows up in the mass. All right? Now, what's really cool about this is, as you start to look here, right, we have to drop these in a hole, get them into that mindset, and see what we're seeing. Now, this is what you'll often see for, like, a picture of an atom. I want you to keep in mind, this is absolutely not what an atom looks like in scale. Um, if you want to imagine what an atom would look like in scale kind of in real life, is imagine going out to our stadium field, right, and looking at a sphere that encompasses the whole stadium field, right? Like 100, 100 meters that way, 100 meters that way, right, as you go all the way around. Imagine that sphere. Put about a grape in the center line, and that's the nucleus. Then take not even gnats, like the tiniest little things you can even imagine that are like buzzing around in that sphere that are taking up the space of the atom. So, mostly empty space, right? It's incredibly empty space, and the nucleus is so tiny and so packed in, it's kind of crazy. You start thinking, you know, stuff like this is solid, and it's absolutely not. You know, then Julie might say something about this too, but the, um, <laughs> right, definitely empty space. But as you look here, right, that's what we're looking at, these tiny, tiny things, and it requires a big drop in energy for those protons to stay in that tiny little space. They don't like <clears throat> each other. Everybody thinks the nucleus is just like these little balls sitting in there. But this is a roiling, boiling mess of things, of these interactions electrically trying to blast the nucleus apart. There's actually protons turning to neutrons as they're exchanging particles. Everything's exchanging all this stuff. And all of that is this grabby version of, I want the potato chips. No, I want the potato chips. That's going to keep us together. Um, those kind of moments are what we're actually seeing in there. It's a crazy little system. And it can be stable, but it can also be unstable. It depends on particles and how many neutrons compared to protons, all that kind of stuff makes a big difference in stability. All right, let me stop there. Questions for any of that part? Cool beans? All right, let's take a look. So here's the weird part. Every different atom has a different level of attraction. So to join one atom, i got to chop a hand off. To join another atom, i got to chop an arm off. You want another atom, i got to chop a leg off, right? I know it's kind of gross to think about, but <laughs> it depends. Every different atom is there. So if I'm a proton in a hydrogen one atom, I don't have to join anything. I'm the only person there, right? But if you look at helium, you'll notice that what we call these the binding energy per particle. How much, how much energy do I need to give up to join that atom? That's why I'm showing it as a negative value. Those particles have to drop in a hole to be in that system. The most stable atom we run into, that which has the least massive particles or the deepest in the hole, is iron. And then as we start to get bigger than iron, 
they start to get not quite as deep in the hole per particle. This is where we tap nuclear energy. It's in the mass difference between the nuclei, between the particles in the nucleus. So this idea is what we're going to kind of kick in here is to think about fission reactions versus fusion. Fission means to break apart. Fusion means to put together. So think about this. See if this makes sense. If I'm a U-235, uranium, right? I naturally have given up a certain amount of energy and mass, or vice versa, to be in this hole. But I haven't given up as much energy to be in my hole. I'm not as deep in the hole per particle as things like barium or krypton. They're more stable. They're deeper in the hole. Well, it turns out that uranium naturally will split because it's a big honk of nucleus and it doesn't like itself very much, right? So it will <laughs> naturally just break apart. And when it breaks apart into what are called daughter nuclei, <clears throat> krypton and barium, they are actually falling deeper in the hole than where they started, which means that energy's got to go somewhere. So every time one of those atoms breaks apart, it gives off energy. Same thing like we did with methane. Started it here. We effectively reshifted them into a, a tighter bond, a deeper hole, so they had to vent energy to heat our homes. Same exact game. That's fission. I just have to have. I just have to make that happen. Truth is, for uranium, that happens naturally. It does it all the time on its own. So when you hear things like half lives and things like that, that's partly because they just do that all the time. You take a chunk of uranium, hang on to it for a while, but you'll die soon. Don't do that for a long time. But if you do that for a while, it's going to start to just, eventually you'll have a chunk of barium and krypton in your hands. It just changes because it will be splitting over time. It takes a little while. I can't remember the half-life. It's a long time. If it's just in its natural, kind of like small states, which we'll talk about how we can speed that up if we want to. If I want to do fusion, let's take something small, heavy particles, and fuse them into bigger ones. Little things fused can get to lower energy. Big things split can get to lower energy. And if I can get to lower energy, I can give that energy away. Let me stop there. Questions about that? Yeah. <clears throat> what about things like deuterium and tritium? Great question. Yeah, so in this case, what you find is there are obviously not as a, a, a large percentage around because they're a little bit more complicated than a simple proton electron set. But for those that aren't familiar with deuterium or tritium, um, those are just different versions of hydrogen that have, to be hydrogen, I have to have one proton. That's just the, a rule, right? That's, it can't be hydrogen unless it has one proton. But I can also have a neutron attached in there as well. And that would be deuterium because there's two particles in the nucleus. If I have two neutrons attached, that'd be three particles for tritium. Um, so in that game, what you'd probably find is for those to be stuck together, they're going to have to be down here somewhere. I didn't map those out. I can look at the values eventually to see. It's going to be probably somewhere between here and helium. I don't know exactly where their stability level would be in that mode, but they do exist. There's small percentages of them out there, and of course they use them for different things, nuclear, you know, um, so for some of the nuclear tech, they like to use deuterium or tritium for certain things. Um, but that would be probably energy-wise. They have to be in a hole or they won't stick together. I don't know if that helps or not. Is that okay? Other questions so far? All right, so next thing, so get this, uh, this idea in mind. We're going to look at our next part. So this is the fission piece I want to take a look at to see if this one makes sense. So think about what happened. I'm a big uranium atom. I naturally tend to decay. One of the things I tend to do is sometimes just spit neutrons out for kicks. Sometimes I'll break into things. It depends what I want to do. But remember, I love that question when you asked about the ignition before, that idea of where does that energy come from. One of the battles that can make these tend to break apart is shoot them with a particle. Just like playing pool, right? Rack them, smack them, boom, see what happens. And in this game, that's kind of what will happen is eventually this thing gets it's just large. It's unstable. Those particles are all bouncing around. They're trying to figure out what to do. And occasionally they will pop neutrons out. Well, if that neutron pops out and hits your nucleus, you absorb it, which will raise your energy enough that you're like, oh, I'll be more stable going here. And they can then split into daughter nuclei. When they do that, they're going to less massive particles per, right? Here I had to chop off a hand. Here I have to chop off an arm, right? That difference is energy that's going to be given off. 
Interestingly, though, the process in this, and this is just kind of basically describing here what we're seeing in the picture, when it does it, it also tends to shoot out multiple neutrons in that fission process. So not only do we get the daughter nuclei, but when we shoot out generally about three extra neutrons. So one neutron popped, now three neutrons go out. Then they hit next ones. And eventually, if you can keep hitting them enough, three, 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 right? Reminds me of a commercial when I was a kid. Remember that? One that kept doing with like a little thing when it kept breaking the screen up and so on and so on. I can't remember what that was for anymore. It's going to kill me. Um, but it just keeps growing. And this is what we would call a chain reaction. And theoretically, that can just, I mean, think about exponential growth by threes. Very quickly, you can go from one nucleus to a load of nuclei in a very short period of time. Each individual break is giving us energy. The little energy from one single atom is nothing crazy. But if I can convert a gram, even, of uranium into energy, that is a crazy amount of energy. But this is happening naturally? It happens naturally all the time. Yep. So that's why that? if you that's why I like Marie Curie died so young, right? They were playing with radioactive rocks and they were getting hit with radiation all the time or in nuclear oh. particles. So they're getting hit with the energy, they're getting hit with the stuff, you're constantly doing that, which then damages your DNA, you get died from cancer for that reason, um, mainly because she was carrying, you know, rocks around in her, in her, in her pockets um, when we didn't know what was going on. So, yeah, it happens all the time. The trick is managing it, right? We want to get it to get enough of this going so we can generate energy if we want to do a fission reactor. We just as soon not get it to totally chain react, unless you want to make a bomb, which is what the whole Manhattan Project was about was trying to get this to be uncontrolled. Is that idea so far? Does anybody have questions about that so far? Yeah. So let's take a look then at this idea. So you may hear this term occasionally. You might even, I can't remember if it showed up during the movie um, along the way if you watch the you know, movie of the summer, but the idea of critical mass. Think about what we need to do to get a chain reaction to go. I've got to get those extra neutrons to hit other nuclei to get them to break. Well, if you imagine, if we have a really small chunk of uranium, a lot of those neutrons are going to escape before they hit anybody. If they escape before they hit anybody, they don't sustain the reaction. So that would be a case where you're subcritical in mass. If you're at the just critical stage, we're actually getting enough neutrons to hit to sustain a reaction and hold it at a certain level, but not enough that it goes exponential. If I'm going to build a nuclear reactor to actually make energy, that's what I want. Right? If I want to make a bomb, what I'm going to do is put a bigger chunk together, and when it goes, it's going to go crazy. And most of the bomb, they knew this would work. Most of the bomb design actually during that time was all about how are we going to take things that are subcritical and get them to a critical mass without blowing up ahead of time. And the other part was, Naturally, when energy starts to go, it's going to tend to start breaking things apart, which is going to then get us subcritical again. So a lot of the explosive tests and things that you were hearing prior to that they were talking to, not about the actual bomb itself, was all about how are we going to get this explosion to keep this stuff imploded so it stays together so that it can continue to react. Because otherwise it'll just go and fizzle. And if you're a nuclear reactor, um, designer, and you want it to do energy, it's all about not letting this happen, and not letting this happen, and get it at a boil right in the middle. Questions about the critical mass idea? It makes sense, right? So far so good? <laughs> all right, all right, let's, we're, we're getting toward it. So here, in this is the case, here's a, a nuclear reactor that you can see. I grew up not too far away from one. Um, my uh, uh, in fact, my brother lives about uh, half a mile from a nuclear reactor out in, in Cleveland section. A lot of folks I knew that used to work there. Um, and one of the interesting parts that they have is what they do. You take a bunch of fuel rods, whatever you want to use, uranium, plutonium, whatever you happen to have. It doesn't really matter what it is. Most of them are going to be uranium. Um, and they are going to naturally react. And then what you tend to do is you use a material like carbon or something that when neutrons hit it, they tend to get absorbed into that structure. So the question uh, that you asked us a little bit ago about the tritium and um, you know uh, tritium and deuterium, 
certain atoms are pretty good at absorbing neutrons and just keeping them in their nucleus. Those are what control rods are. So what we can do is get that thing reacting. It starts to get a little too much, let's put the control rods in a little farther, absorb some neutrons, slow the reaction down. If it starts to fizzle, pull the control rods out. The reaction will start to heat up and you can basically thermostat it to keep it at the level that you want, to generate the heat that you want. And then you generate heat, you heat up water, it runs a turbine with the steam, you turn an electrical generator, a little magnet inside of a coil of wire, and then you go ahead and you can generate electricity, send it to people's houses. And we've had, you know, I can't remember how many nuclear plants are active in Wisconsin right now. Um, I can't remember at this point. And then we've had a number that were online for a while. They're starting to kind of decrease in number because some of the ones are coming just to their age. Um, it'll be an interesting thing in the coming years. I think this will be a bridge energy probably between some of the other things that we're working on. Um, just to reduce fossil fuel use, you'll probably start to see them. Um, they're starting to see things called, uh, research on things called SMRs, which are small modular reactors. Ones that they can actually build in factories and take places. They're smaller, they can do kind of more local <laughs> energy for a community rather than have to have this massive plant to serve the entire city of Milwaukee, that kind of thing. Um, could be shipped around the world to different things. So it'll be interesting to see in the next 10 to 20 years um, how much nuclear energy will start to go up. Those investments are starting around the world. We're a little slower here in the States, but it's coming. Um, we'll probably start to see them crank up a little bit. Are there issues? Sure, if there's nuclear waste you have to deal with. Um, I think right now, though, they said the, the amount of nuclear waste that we've created in about 40 years you could put on a football field. Um, it's not a major stacked about maybe, I think it was maybe 10 meters high or something. It's not this crazy, crazy amount of stuff. There's plans for storage. It's just, you know, governmental slowness. Uh, the whole Yucca Mountain thing that people probably heard about, maybe where the storage uh, facility that they kind of designed and thought and whatever. Um, it's probably going to be a bridge energy for us for a period of time. Maybe not the solution forever, but I have a feeling you're going to be seeing more of the fission stuff as we go. Now, on the bomb side, this is the one that was called Little Boy, I think it was. Um, there was Fat Man and Little Boy were the two bombs that were actually dropped um, on Japan during World War II. And, uh, I was reading about that so much. It's such an interesting thing, historically such an interesting thing for was it a good thing? Was it humane? Was it not? Was it whatever? There's so many debates about it. I, I, I won't get into that piece. But from a structural standpoint, all they did was effectively said, I'm going to take a subcritical mass here and a subcritical mass here, and I'm going to set a little explosion off that jams them together. And then I'm critical. Once I'm critical, it takes off on its own. And that was it. I should say supercritical at that point. And then we have to make sure also to design other parts and pieces of the thing to make sure to keep them together while they are chain reacting uncontrollably. I like this one more than that one <laughs> um, in terms of that set. Questions about that? And what's the rate that that happens in the bomb? You know, I think in a sense, I think it goes very fast. I think once that explosion comes, once that, once that, once the, 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 basically the two pieces mate, you immediately start going to chain reacting. It's a matter of milliseconds, probably microseconds even, uh, in terms of how quickly those neutrons go out. Because again, if it takes too long, it's going to take a lot, you know, everything's going to start to kind of break apart and you're not going to be able to maintain that supercritical state. So it has to happen incredibly fast, which is why, boom, boom I mean, that thing just goes crazy, big flash of light, mushroom cloud, the whole thing crazy when it goes off. Yeah. So, so the obvious thing is, when gravity takes it and hits the ground, that's what propels this? Well, actually what they do is they have a time to go off before it hits the ground. It's there much more damaging if they actually land, if they actually blow up in the air. Um, and this and this is interesting. The bomb that they showed and some of the footage that they showed in the uh, in the movie was for, I think, a one kiloton bomb. And so effectively that, that atomic bomb that they created was one kiloton of TNT. So imagine take TNT, take a ton of it, which is a lot, take a thousand tons of it and blow it up. That was that one bomb that they did for testing. Um, I can't remember the uh, bombs that were dropped that were in that range. Enough to take, you know, probably 10 mile, 50 mile range. Um, scary when you get to nuclear, the nuclear bombs, which are the hydrogen bombs, which we'll talk about briefly. Um, they started to get into the, as much as 50 megaton of, think about it. So that's a, another, megas are another thousand on top of that. So they got to be insane. Uh, most of our tactical nuclear weapons, I think, now are in the one or two megaton range. You know, 
which means drop what I'm on walking and it would flatten out to probably, I don't know, uh, one mile would probably take us out well past Brookfield, you know, gone. So it's scary. Uh, and I think we had targeted during the height of the Cold War, probably had, uh, Dan knew all this info, he was so good at this stuff, uh, Dan Davis, that is, I mentioned. But we must have had, I think we had something like 50 or 60 of them targeted at Milwaukee at the time because we were an industrial center. Um, they had cities in the states targeted to a size of about 1,500, 2,000 populations. The Soviets had enough bombs to actually target that many, to that population size. Um, Thus, you know, that whole idea of mutual destruction was insane. And scary still, because we don't exactly have a stable human in, uh, in Russia these days. Um, yeah? I hear um, that the power destructive possibilities of progress, and I hear that you want to leave that conversation for another time, and yeah. at the same time when we teach it to the students, you know, progress in the hands of immoral people can be very destructive, and yeah. is that a conversation that gets looped into powerful technologies? That's a great question, and I, I do think so, and I think in the high school particularly, I can't speak for other divisions because I don't spend time in those individual classrooms, and they're probably not getting... They'll talk about electricity, or they'll talk yeah. about, the, you know, it's not quite to that level. So, yes. um, but if I, for example, if we're covering nuclear energy in my AP physics class, which we will later in this year, we'll talk about those things, you know. If we're talking about just generation, what kind of things do we have to think about? What's the good, what's the bad? Um, you know, even technologies like burning coal or burning, you know, fossil fuels, and we look at the, the I mean, I grew, like with my parents having grown up in Pennsylvania, I looked at what the result of, areas were that had been mined, the slag heaps, all the stuff that was left, the waste was insane. What it did to the environment around that area is crazy. So like, you know, looking at those things I think is really important to always weigh and so much of it just for us, for us to exist in the world that we exist in, we have to look at those. So we'll talk about that a bit. Um, I tend to, when I teach students, I don't do as much work with the bombing stuff because I, I prefer to look more at the nuclear energy piece, but we definitely spend time talking about what can happen with technology. I know that comes up in conversations in our bio classes as well, when you start thinking about all the different things we, we can do and what we can't do. Um, I'm interested, like talking with my son now, he's in that school, and just like how much they look at those sort of things when they're looking at treatments and all the different parts and pieces you can do and how much of what's ethical, what's not, what's this, what's that, what research is being done, how do you do it, how do you do it in the best possible way. Um, so I think a lot of those conversations come up because the kids are old enough in sophomore or senior year, being freshmen to some degree, I think, um, to have them when we get there. Uh, so I think we try to cover them as delicately as we can, if that makes sense. But yeah, it's a great question. I think it absolutely is important because it isn't just a scientific question often. So it's a policy question, it's a thought predicate. It, it is definitely important. Yeah? Do you have any uh, notion of direct conversion without going through the thermal process to Electricity. Yeah, you know, I've read, I've read a little bit about it. I've got to be honest, I haven't read deeply enough to really talk too much. But the idea of, that's being shared is right now there's a heat engines in general are inherently inefficient because you're using temperature gradients to get something hot against something cold, like a combustion engine against the outside atmosphere that allows me to push a piston or drive a turbine. So we're using basically a flow of heat to do that. In this case, heat up water, use it to drive a turbine, it gets cool the water at the end. Um, and so that's a heat process. And those are best and best efficiency you can get for a heat engine, even in a, in a fairly well-run thing, is probably 30-40% out, outlay of energy that you're going to get. Um, so you're wasting a lot of heat that you're not being able to use from this reaction on that transfer. So there are ways that people are looking at to see if they can directly take the nuclear energy and turn it directly into electricity. Um, I haven't read enough about where that tech is. I haven't heard anything new, and even with the SMRs that are coming out, they're still heat, heat engine driven, so I don't know. I don't know enough about that to say for sure. All right, how do we feel here? I mean, other than a little bit disturbed in some ways, but I know, I'm with you on that for sure. Yeah. Um, let me do the last one, just kind of get, the, get on the tail end here. So we can also remember, take the massive uranium atoms, or sorry, the, the, effectively that massive one, and kind of turn them into less massive, right, barium krypton, use that mass energy to, to get heat. We can also take small nuclei, fuse them together, and make things like helium. 
That's the process that drives all the suns, drives our sun, drives all the stars. That's where really all of our energy comes from. If it weren't for the sun, we wouldn't be here. So in this case, that's happening at the center and in the, uh, of, the, of the sun. That's what we're seeing. And because of these incredibly hot energies, we have the ignition that's already there that heats up the star. But we got so much gravity from such an incredibly large mass that it can compress these hydrogen molecules really close to one another. And as they get really close to one another, they will start to actually bang into each other. They don't like each other very much, but if they get close enough and smack into each other, they can start to fuse. And in this case, really weirdly, the process of four protons, by this time, we mentioned before, what happens if you heat up gases, the electrons start to strip, we're in a plasma state. Those protons, four of them can bang together, and weirdly, because of that whole strong nuclear weird sort of particle stuff that happens at the quantum level, Protons, two of them will actually turn into neutrons. And they will actually pop out a little thing called a positron, which is their positiveness that leaps, which is also what happens to us in February. Um, <laughs> and as it starts to leave, we will end up with this nucleus that is more tightly bonded, deeper in the well, and gives off a ton of energy. Notice that energy gap, if you remember from the graph that we had. There was a small mass difference here between particle to particle. We did uranium into krypton and barium. There is a really big difference between a, a kind of a bald proton in a hydrogen and a bonded proton, a neutron, in a helium nucleus. Tons of energy there, which is what drives our entire universe. There's no, none of this energy anywhere exists in the universe without that original kind of set of hydrogen things fusing into helium. So eventually our sun will start to run out of fuel and start fusing other things, get a little bigger, get a little bigger. And then eventually it'll swell up and then it'll collapse. <laughs> and, you know, we won't be here. It's not going to happen tomorrow. But it's, you know, it's coming. It's just the nature of how things work in, uh, in solar systems. And so it's just an interesting thing as we create. And what we do is take all particles, bonded particles, drop in energy, give off energy there. And that's fusion. Tricks. The hard part is, how do I get something hot enough that it can overcome the repulsions to get close enough that the strong nuclear force can take over? I've got to be coming in crazy fast, which means we need to be crazy hot. Well, the hotter I make gases, what do they want to do? They want to expand. So how do I compress it now, too, is the next battle. The sun does it because it's got gravity. All the other stars do it because they have incredible amounts of gravity. We have a really hard time doing that because if I get it that hot and I try to contain it, it's going to melt anything that's containing it. Right? So there's this constant battle of how do we do that. Recently, you've seen in the news, some, they finally got to the point where we actually put in less energy than we got out. Up until this point, they could make fusion happen, but we had to put in more energy to make the reaction happen than we got out, which that doesn't seem like a great, that's not a winner. Um, if you're gonna, I got some oceanfront property in Nebraska, if you're like that, um, for the investment. But you really have to think about how that works, right? So process-wise, what we're going to see is different, these are the two kind of main competing things that are working for fusion. One is called a tokamak system. The other one is laser implosion. So. Um, in one case, what they're doing is using magnetic fields because magnetic fields can basically deflect the movement of charged particles. And if I can use magnetic fields to contain it, I don't have to touch anything physical. Because if I have to touch it, I'm going to melt it. So we use those to kind of contain them, compress them, heat them, get them to fuse and get energy out. Or this is kind of a cool one. They literally will, light does have pressure. It's actually a particle in nature. So I can actually take, they take a little ball of basically hydrogen and they just bang it with lasers from all directions and it'll superheat and compress it to the point where they do that. Um, an idea, the trick comes down to how do I roll the ball in <laughs> over and over again and try to get that to be a sustainable thing for a, um, an actual reaction. Um, so it's just a sustainable way to make energy. But those are the ones that are kind of of interest um, that people are working on right now. And they're building some big ones all around the world right now to see if they'll actually a sustainable way to make energy. You know, wouldn't it be nice if you have a, a little leak and all you do is go talk with this for a little while because some helium leaked out? Like, not a big deal, right? Um, these are inherently safer in some degrees because if they stop, if they actually have a problem, they just stop working, right? So there's a little bit better there. I will say from the nuclear energy, from the fission perspective, you know, everybody always thinks, oh, there's Chernobyl, there's, you know, whatever, there's, you know, three mile out. Uh, when you look at the accidents that have happened and when they happened, if you look over the last you know, great number of years, like we've had very, very few um, that have been 
that. If you look at other damage from all kinds of other ways we create energy, probably nuclear is on the cleaner side for our lives. Waste is still an issue, but that's really the trick. And you know, it'll be interesting to see. This is, you know, as joke every article says, um, fusion's about 10 years away. You know, <laughs> and they've been saying that for 40 years. So, um, <laughs> well, it's it's taking a little time, but they're getting closer, which is pretty amazing. Um, and then, if you want to hear about the um, next piece, which would be the actual bomb. You may have heard the inkling of that from Teller um, during the movie. He says, I've got this other idea I want to work on. And his idea was to make the super, which became the hydrogen bomb, or what's also known as, I often think we'll see with atomic bombs versus nuclear bombs. They're both nuclear, but atomic tend to be fission bombs as opposed to hydrogen bombs. And really his very relatively simple idea, technically it's difficult, but it's basically to use an atomic bomb light that off so that it will compress a big chunk of hydrogen and create a multiply, just crazy bigger um, amount of energy from the fusion of hydrogen. Um, I think the biggest one that the Soviets ever dropped on, let's say it was like 100 megatons of TNT equivalent. Like it was insane. Um, the Bikini Atoll that we've, you know, that we did a bunch of testing on, like they will not be life there for a long period of time. Displaced a lot of folks. Um, interesting things, again, when you start thinking about even the testing during Manhattan Project and all the process that was doing there, there was a lot of illness and high cancer rates in the entire surrounding area, New Mexico and all the folks. Um, quite a few of the folks were indigenous people that were doing all the mining of uranium in that area, too. And it's like, yeah, go down, dig it up, it'll be all good. Um, and so there's a lot of things that, you know, that often that we would talk about in class for, that would be on that particular moment. That everything we do, there's always costs, there's always benefits, and it's that tricky you know, that's what makes the most sense. I think that's my last slide. Is there, are there any other questions that anybody has before we start to wrap things up? Can you walk back three slides to the, the written, one more? Yeah. The reactor on the left? Yeah. So the, the issue becomes what? If you don't push the control rods in at the right, or there's nobody there to man it, or the control rods go away. I'm thinking of like the Ukraine issue, right, where they're like, hey, we got this reactor, and it's potentially a problem. Right. So what hap what's the problem? I mean, if you break the, if the water goes away, it doesn't cool. Then yeah, in some ways that's where the water cooling cooling process it, comes right? from. Yeah. But you really, but the control rods also grab those. Yeah, right, and these are generally up. set to be down in, right? Yeah. So if it fails, you're going to tend to get control drop rods drop, you're going to tend to get things set from there. Okay. Um, so there, there are safety systems in place from there, but you know, one of the things you, you, you really bring that's a huge point to it is, or, or a huge, I guess one of the parts that makes you more worried about it is where are we putting them, right? If it's, you know, the one that's sitting in um, just outside of where I grew up in, in about 20 miles east of Cleveland is a very stable part of the world. <laughs> and you look at that and say, okay, I'm not worried right now that there's going to be an invasion coming here and bombs flying from somewhere, drones coming from somewhere um, that could possibly impact that site. And so it, that's the one thing that I start to be, starts to become kind of a question. It's the one part from the nuclear side that becomes questionable. It's where are, they, where are they being deployed? What's going to happen with that material? How safe are these zones? If somebody does take that, um, say the Russians come in and they take that, or whatever happens now, what happens with the material that's in it? You know, again, in the U.S., very tight regulation, appropriately so, on where that material is, where, what new material we have, where is it, it's accounted for, we know what we have. Um, other countries, not so much, because they're just not as efficient right. um, at that uh, type of process as we are. So it gets an interesting question for how do we set them up, what's the safety level, what's the default mode. Uh, they, they've gotten better over the last 50 years, you know, in time, in terms of how they shut themselves down. But it is an interesting question from a vision. I agree. Yeah. Question uh, the disposal of the nuclear waste. Mm -hmm. And for a number of years, I recall that uh, they were going to use magnetic accelerators to send the waste product to the, to the sun. Right. There was, there, was a, there was an interesting proposal in that mode that's like, let's just get rid of it there. Um, I'm sure the sun's looking up going, hey, what are you putting it here for? But the, uh, not my neighborhood. But, the, uh, but yeah, it was an interesting thing. I think, again, just think about the energy it takes to put anything in orbit. But the, the interesting part is the amount of waste is not, that we've produced for a long period, that's not that large. Um, right now, it's all very tightly regulated. The, the, I think 
virtually all of it is actually stored on site at the nuclear reactor sites themselves. Um, they put them in containment vessels, they put them underwater, they do all these kind of things to keep them in a safe zone. Um, the, there are issues with, like I said, the, the most off, the off-sited, I guess, uh, proposal is, to, is the Yucca Mountain site, which was one of these incredibly stable mountain areas that they kind of could put it in tunnels and put them away for a while. Whether, but then you still have to transport it, not the, you know, it's, there's, there's risks always. Um, it would be nice to see that get off the ground and done. But, you know, yeah. we're, I think we're learning that it takes a tremendous amount of energy to get something to go into orbit around the sun yeah. and to just take it up in the low Earth orbit. For sure. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it, we're in a very deep hole. <laughs> we're in a very deep hole, for sure. All right. Any, I probably should let you guys start to get about your day. <laughs> but that is there great. anything else in mind? We're good? Wonderful. Thank you. Cool. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you.